Wow, thank you so much for having me out today to speak about this subject. Thank you for all coming out in the pouring rain, which lasted for maybe 30 seconds. I don't know, I'm not from the Bay Area, maybe this is normal. Um, but nonetheless, I appreciate it. What I wanna do today is share with you some of the historical background um, that I've learned during the years I've been researching this subject about what economic opportunity and economic rights have looked like for women in the United States. Um, this is a, a matter though the impact extends much further than just women living in this country. Women in many parts of the world today are still facing some of the same legal restrictions I'm gonna talk about having applied to women in American history. Um, so it's a topic where we can really step back and learn from the experience in this country, like Lydia was mentioning, about how much has changed. Um, you might not be fully aware yet of how much has changed. Some of it is a bit shocking. Um, when you <laughs> dig into the history, you might be surprised. Um, but look at how much that change has happened and try to reflect on how is it that this group of people who faced so many disadvantages were able to come so far and make so many changes in their lives. So the title of the topic, Women's Economic Rights in the US. So first, it might be worth spending just a little bit of time defining what I mean by an economic right. So I'll spend just a very brief couple of minutes on that. And then we'll get right into the meat of how have women's economic rights changed over time and what we can learn from this history. So there's an economist named Armin Alshin, uh, a well-known property rights economist, and he defined a right not as um, kind of a single object, but as a bundle. And what he meant by this is that when we talk about something like the ability to make an economic decision, that's not like a yes or a no. You can either use all your resources the way you want to or you can't. Instead, for any given resource that you have access to, there are a million different ways that you could use it, some of which are gonna be allowed and some of which are not gonna be allowed. Um, so you never have full property rights over an object. So if you think about something like a hammer, you can own a hammer, you can hold on to it, you can know it's yours, you can build with it, you can decorate with it, um, you could try to like stir up like a cake with it or something, I don't know. You can get creative, um, but you can't hit somebody with it. So that's not a right that you have. Um, so over any object, there are always some limits to the rights that we have to be able to employ them. Um, so when we're talking about something like what economic rights do women have, what I wanna ask is, for women and for women's decisions about what they're gonna be allowed to do with their property, with the resources that they own. And of course, some of our most valuable resources are our own time and energy and ingenuity. So the ability to make any decision you want with your own kind of creative powers is, is an important part of what kind of economic rights you have. So I'm thinking there of decisions like what kind of skills are you going to develop? How are you gonna educate yourself? What kind of activity are you going to engage in? Are you going to work or are you not going to work? Things like that. And so this little kind of bullet point that I put down at the bottom of the page, that the key question is who is planning your life? When you think about these fundamental decisions that, that we make, um, many of which, so all of which have some economic component to them, but many of which really heavily depend on our ability to have access to our own kinds of resources, the decisions about where we're gonna live, how we're gonna spend our time, who we're going to associate with. Um, you know, reflect on your own transition over time from someone who lived in a home under someone else's roof to being someone who was living out on your own and, and able to make your own decisions. If you don't have access to the purse strings, if you don't have the authority to make those kind of decisions, you're severely limited in the kind of options you're able to take care of, if you're, or that you're able to take advantage of. If you're living at home, if your father is the steward, then you kind of have to get his permission anytime you want to change something. Women in American history 
had to get permission to do almost anything. Um, not necessarily always explicit permission, but there was this implicit structure where there was always a person that could veto any kind of decision you wanted to make. So first, this would have been your father when you were living at home, and then when you moved away, it would have been your husband. Um, so the heritage of this, where this idea comes from, has its roots in Roman Catholic law. It took various forms in England under common law in the 17th and 18th centuries. And by the time you get to the founding of the United States, so we're talking around 1800, um, this treatise that Blackstone had written nearly 150 years earlier um, kind of solidified what most states and territories took to be the governing principles of their family law, which is that once two people get married, they're not two people anymore, they're one person. So that's that kind of religious doctrine that I was talking about coming into the law. And what that means, if you're only one person, you can't meaningfully talk about what's yours and what's mine. All of it is the collectives. And the way that this was organized under the law is that the husband was the person who had decision-making and legal authority for that collective. So when you have husband and wife considered to be legally one person, what this means is that married women can't own their own land. Um, if you do hear about women owning land or running businesses in the early part of the 19th century, most of the time they were widows. So you like finally got this moment when you could really be your own after your husband died. You know, how, how sad is that? <laughs> but for most of your life while you're married, you can't independently own this land. You can't keep any wages that you earn because they become to be considered your husband's property. Um, you can't sign contracts without your husband's permission. That goes back to the whole not having your own independent legal identity thing. You can't uh, write a will. Um, so that might seem like it doesn't quite fit on this list in terms of level of importance, but it does because throughout history, one of the driving principles that kind of motivates people to better themselves and to acquire and to cultivate what they have is that they're going to be able to give it to their children one day. Um, so formally under the law, women did not have a voice in that decision. Now, does this mean that women were never listened to. Um, is this, uh, you know, really that bad? I think the best way to think about that is to ask, what does it look like in the hard case? So, of course, when you're living with someone, it's hard to ignore them completely. So women probably did have some say in how decisions were made. Um, you know, for no other reason than it's really, really awkward to sleep next to someone who you have made exceedingly angry that day. Um, so the fact that men and women live close together is probably some bit of a casual check most of the time. Um, probably in most normal circumstances, um, this might have worked out relatively reasonably. You know, it's probably why when we think of the early 19th century, we don't think of, you know, the great war of women killing their husbands. Um, because you have that, that level of peace. Um, but, and this was a guiding principle behind a lot of the early women's rights advocates, is that when this situation goes bad, when you are, when you have entered a legal arrangement like this, um, and your husband does not kind of exercise that authority responsibly, it can get extremely ugly. There's nowhere you can go. You have no money no land, you can't get divorced. You have, to, you have to prove that you've been abandoned for seven years before you can get a divorce as a woman. Um, there's a little bit of variation in this between states, but in, in most states at the, the early part of the 19th century, that's true. And if you're a man, you can't get divorced from your wife unless you can prove she cheated on you, which is a, that's a difficult thing to prove in a court of law. Um, so you can't get out of this arrangement and it creates a lot of opportunity for exploitation and abuse. Um, the ability to take advantage of an exit option is always one of the greatest 
safeties that we have as a people. Um, the fact that there's somewhere to go when the house starts burning down. Um, in many ways, what this legal regime did was it cut off where women could go when the house started burning down. And like I said, there are, these laws still exist, not in the United States, but in other parts of the world. So this is um, a very a, a legal uh, kind of set of principles that has a lot of contemporary relevance. OK, so my big question is, how did so much change? You know, that legal situation I described probably doesn't sound familiar to you as a big part of United States history or something that um, your mother or your grandmother would have dealt with. So by the time we get up to kind of living memory, it's mostly erased. And what I want to do is I want to go through some important changes that happened in the 19th century that really had a big influence on changing the way that women um, were able to make decisions and changing the way they were treated under the law. So first, I want to look at this idea of women having opportunities to work outside the home that they didn't have before. OK, now this gets to what I was saying about having options and having your ability to exit. So if we go back to 1800, the United States is almost entirely agrarian. Almost everybody is living and working on a farm. Most people would have spent a good bit of their lives kind of within that same farming community that they were born, unless you were in the minority percentage of the population that was, had the settler bug and was continuing to move further and further west. For, for a lot of people there, Within that agrarian lifestyle, what this means is that women's work options are either they stay at home and work on the farm and create goods like soap, cloth, candles inside the home, or they work on a farm and create goods like soap, cloth, and candles in somebody else's home. Um, so those are kind of your two big work options. And then something happens called the Industrial Revolution. And essentially, so it's, it's complicated. People will even give you different times for when it starts or what it means. But innovators devise this ability to bring together a larger group of people and a larger uh, kind of set of technologies together in one place and had previously been compiled. And they figure out ways to produce on a large scale within a factory system that means that you're, you can create a lot more in an hour than you could before. Okay. So well before industrialization, making cloth looked something like this. It was usually you, maybe a small group of female relatives or uh, neighbors working together inside the house. After industrialization, this is what making cloth looks like. So it's kind of interesting uh, the way that these technologies get imported into the United States. Although America is often seen and, and is in many ways this country that has just produced innovation on an unprecedented scale, most of these earliest technologies were actually developed in Great Britain and stolen by the Americans. <laughs> uh, so what happened was that at this time, early 1800, there, you know, I don't know if you guys remember your early American history, but there's a little bit of tension between the United States and Britain. Just, you know, a little war called the Revolutionary War, um, War of Independence. So this kind of tiff persisted. Um, and at this time, tense relations between countries often met, often meant trying to out compete each other and not really wanting to trade with each other or allow other countries to get some kind of competitive or market advantage. So Great Britain said, none of our technology is getting to those silly United States. Um, so what the early American industrialists did was they would send people over to tour the factories and then they would just visually try to kind of figure out what was going on and bring back those ideas and those technologies into the United States. Um, so one of these gentlemen, Francis Cabot Lowell, 
There's still a city called Lowell, Massachusetts. You can go and visit it. You can go and visit these buildings pictured right here. They still exist. You can go in one of them, probably a couple of them actually, are still operating as textile factories where you can go in and check out kind of what those conditions might have looked like a little bit. Um, but they bring over this technology. And so women who have already developed the skills to be able to weave cloth on a loom can now take those skills and they can go into this factory system and they can now produce, and this is in the very earliest factories, they could produce four times as much per hour than they could have at home on their own. So what this means is that women have this increase in their productivity, or for those of you studying economics, their marginal productivity is now higher than it was before. And what this means, when your marginal productivity goes up, you can command a greater wage. Um, so you now, instead of just being limited to producing inside the home, women had this alternative where they can actually make something for themselves by going into the city and engaging in this kind of work. So it really becomes kind of an unprecedented opportunity for these women. Um, because like I said previously, they're limited to this kind of household production. And it's, it's not that they had to go to work in the factories, but now they had the option. It's kind of like, in, in a way, being able to have one of those early factory jobs was kind of like the way most of us think about going off to college. You know, like you're at home, you think you're going to be stuck there in this small town forever, and then all of a sudden you have this ability to make the choice, you can move to the big city and strike out on your own. And in a lot of ways, for most women, this is kind of the first time that they really have that opportunity. So... Since it didn't exist before, nobody knew this was an option. So these companies had to figure out some way to get the word out. So what they would do is they would actually hire recruiters to go around to the different farm towns in the industrial Northeast and try to convince their parents that this wasn't some like kind of like weird form of like white slavery or prostitution or like any other kind of weird thing that they might have thought it was since it was so foreign. Um, and they had to instead persuade them that their daughter's moral and physical health would be well cared for if they, come, if they came and engaged in this kind of opportunity. So on this equation, you have you know, two sides engaged in this negotiation. You have these factory owners who have advantage or who have this technology that if they can take advantage of it is going to allow them to be so much more productive than they were before. And you have women who really could benefit a lot from this system too, but you need some way to kind of get them together. So there's always this kind of learning process whenever you have an innovation in an economy like this. In addition to learning from the recruiters, the women themselves who came to work in the factories and the stories that they would tell were also an important ingredient in kind of getting the word out that this was an option. Um, so these early factory jobs, you know, how many people have read or seen um, a kind of documentary or a novelization or a fictionalization of what it was like to work in an early factory? Just like the horrible working conditions, um, you get trapped and die in a fire, all of these, no safety exits, no breaks, things like that. Um, there's no question that the work was hard. So these women were working 12-hour days usually, 12 hours on your feet, no matter what you're doing, it's not going to be easy. Um, we're talking about before air conditioning, so kind of like Dudley Moorhead Hall. Um, but so clear, this is a difficult job. Um, and I don't want to take anything away from that. Um, but if you were on the farm still, if you were working at home on the farm, you also would be working that 12, 14 hour day. But what doesn't happen on the farm is you don't get the kind of after work socialization and educational opportunities that they provided for these women. So as part of the incentive to encourage them to come and take advantage of this new kind of opportunity, um, and it, you know, it's kind of interesting, this looking back, but by the way, most of the accounts that you've read or fictionalizations you've seen are later in the, the time period of industrialization, actually, those are usually more like early 20th century when the factories have gotten a lot bigger um, and conditions a lot more crowded. 
these early factories um, probably might not have looked quite so bad. Um, but when you read contemporary accounts, they're not con really concerned about those working conditions at all. Um, that's not something that becomes an issue until late 19th, early 20th century when people are wealthier and they're, um, you know, they have other better opportunities and now these factories don't look as good in comparison. When you read contemporary accounts of these factories, they don't talk about that. Um, what they talk more about um, is like how can they get into those jobs that these women have? So these factory owners get letters from people from around the world. Um, you know, how can we get our daughters a job in your factory? Um, especially from Europe, coming out of Europe, they have famine conditions at this time in some parts of the world. Um, and so there's really pretty desperate competition for these jobs. Um, not just because of the pay, but also because of the classes they provide in the evenings. Um, so this quote right here is actually from one of the early women who worked in these factories. Um, she was the editor of a publication that was completely female written and edited and produced um, in this kind of factory community. That's a picture of, of one of the, the cover of one of the issues. Um, and she went on to become you know, a well-known writer. In her memoir, you can go on Google Books, go to the library, read it today. Um, you know, people don't write enduring memoirs from unimportant moments in history. You know, this was an important moment in history and being one of these women kind of meant a lot. Oh, here's a, here's a picture of some of the advertisements and the competition that they did. So these are things that I went into newspaper archives and pulled out about what people were writing out about at the time about these employment practices. And so this is a little bit of what it might have looked like, these kind of advertisements trying to persuade women to come into these mills. Okay, so why did I talk about that so much? So remember, the big question is, how does this group that has so much legal and political disadvantage improve their situation? And opportunity is such a key ingredient of that that when women get this new kind of economic opportunity, it changes the calculus about what kind of laws should be in effect governing their property. So one thing that happens, these women are making enough, and by the way, these are young women, they're the age of most of you in the audience, kind of 18 to 25, they would come work for just a few years, and some of them would walk away from those few years of employment with up to, in, a, you know, in adjusted terms, put in terms of today's dollars, up to 20,000 in the bank. Um, you know, how many of you socked away 20,000 in your first four years of employment? Because I know I did not. Um, so they were buying pianos, putting their brothers through medical school, um, starting to make investments, buying their own apartments. So once young single women about to be married have resources that are important to them and that they want to keep, um, the idea that they have to give all of that up to get married suddenly sounds a lot more disturbing than it did before, than when they didn't really have any resources of their own before they went into marriage. So all of a the sudden, these kind of economic rights become something that is extremely important. And the fact that these women were so critical to one of the most um, fast-growing and exciting areas of the economy means that up in the northern part of the country is where you see most of the legal change taking place. So this map you're looking at is a map that shows for every state how early within the 19th century did they say it is no longer okay for husbands to acquire all of their wives' property. Instead, married women have the right to hang on to their separate property and they have the right to hang on to any earnings they make. And the darker the shade of gray, the earlier those economic rights are protected. This is where all the factories are, and this is where all the earliest legal change takes place. Um, and that's not a coincidence. All right. So in addition to this new kind of economic opportunity, another factor I want to talk about that was really important in 
And this is important to understanding any kind of legal change that took place in the 19th century, is the fact that the United States is a federal system. Um, and especially, so this kind of marriage and property law that I've been talking about, all of this is decided individually at the state level. So this is not nationwide legislation. This is individual states make their own determinations. So what this happens is that now, because of these economic opportunities that I described in the first part, you have women able to choose where they want to live. Um, but because of this structure where different states are coming up on their own with what they want their laws to be, you also have a wide range of different possible legal situations for these women to choose from. All right, so there are two necessary ingredients you need for this kind of political competition to work. Um, and what do I mean by political competition? So when we think about competition in the marketplace, you think about different producers kind of jockeying with each other to come up with the best thing they can offer the consumer to get that consumer to buy their product. Now the analog here is that we can also see this kind of a competitive force going on potentially in politics. So if you have states able to decide what their laws are going to be, maybe we get states engaging in the same kind of jockeying for what kind of legal regime can I offer to these women that is going to seem more attractive to them than the alternative. Um, so the, those are the two ingredients. You have women able to choose where they want to live, what legal regime they want to live under, and you have producers, these states, offering different kinds of legal choices to them. All right, so whenever you hear about that theory for the first time, this idea that there might be some kind of legal competition among states, how many of you are hearing about it for the first time? Okay, a few of you. So how many of you have heard about it before then? That was less than 100%, guys. All right, but so maybe the first time you heard about it, maybe today, um, probably one concern that came to mind is, well, it's really costly to move. Um, normally, when we think about you know, producers offering different kinds of toothbrushes, it's really easy for me to, to, when I go to the store, pick which one of those toothbrushes is going to be better for me. Um, it's not so easy to pick what kind of law is going to be best. It's not quite so simple to even know what that law is, let alone pick up your whole life and move somewhere else. So I guess the question I want to ask here is how plausible is it in this case of these young female workers that they would have been actually making those kind of decisions, making those kind of choices? Um, and the important technology here to understand, so the important technology with the new opportunities was this new factory system, this new way of production. Um, but here, in terms of mobility and here, to, in terms of choosing what law you're going to live under, the new technology that matters is the railroad. So prior to the railroad, um, getting around the United States is just a really cumbersome kind of process. Um, if any of you played Oregon Trail when you were in elementary school, um, you probably didn't make it to the West Coast. You probably died of dysentery before you got there. Um, that's quite possible that that you know, could have happened to you if you were a real settler in the early part of the 19th century. What the railroads do is they take that travel time, which before their invention, it's going to take you, even after the trails are relatively well established, at least three to six months to get out there, and maybe even longer, I'm talking about getting from the East Coast to California. Um, the, earlier, uh, the earliest ventures would have taken closer to a year even. You can now get from New York to California in just three days. So we're talking about just a really dramatic change in terms of how easy it is to move around the country. Um, and this is particularly important because I just want to flip back to this map for a minute. 
So these earliest advances in women's economic rights took place in the industrial Northeast. But then later in the century, if you look at the, at the shades of gray that represent kind of the 1880s, 1890s, these ones right here, now all of a sudden you see a lot of the change taking place out in the West. And the reason why it took place out in the West was because you couldn't get there before and now you can. And couple that with the fact that there is a, a territorial system of governance that really incentivizes politicians to attract population to their part of the country, all of a sudden you get this recipe for this kind of jockeying for women's attention similar to what you had in the Northeast at the time that this factory system was devised. Okay, so how, how did that work? All right, so to become a governor of a territory, what you are is you're basically a hired gun for the president. Literally, most of the early territorial governors came out of the military. They're appointed directly by the executive branch. They're often extremely small governments. Um, when a territory is initially founded, the government might be four people, and that might actually be a significant portion of the population <laughs> in the region at that time because um, much of it is extremely unsettled. And what these territorial governors' mission is, is to try to settle that land before anybody else can. Before Spain, before Mexico, before France, to try to establish residence there, um, despite the fact that maybe it's already actually owned by an indigenous population already living in that area. So there's this drive to really populate that land very quickly so that they can justify and make the case to Congress that this should be part of the Union and that the United States can kind of win this race of expanding to fill up as much of the North American continent as it can. Um, and the reason, the way that these territorial governors keep their jobs then is that they have to be effective at that goal. They have to be effective at attracting population into that part of the country. And so one of the things they do is they get really active about convincing ladies to move there. So almost every frontier when it's initially established, historically speaking at least, has been predominantly male. So men tend to be the first settlers. Um, the first ships that would have um, come over from the European, to the European continent to the United States would have been primarily men. Um, if you look at kind of the population map for any year, wherever the western edge of the American continent is, those places are almost all men. So Denver was like 5% women when it was first founded. Um, that's not uncommon at all. Um, of course, you know, hopefully I don't have to explain how that's not going to facilitate a lot of population growth. Um, so you need kind of some other ingredients going on there in order to really grow that portion of the country. So one of the things they do is they get really active about trying to bring out women. Um, so these are quotes from letters that these governors wrote. They wrote them for publication in newspapers. Um, these editorials were distributed in newspapers across the country, so they were republished. Um, so if you were living in New York or Philadelphia or living up in Vermont, living in Chicago, you could read this letter. And what this letter would tell you as a young woman is the, in, the whole list of benefits and advantages you could get if you decided to move out west and in particular to settle in this part of the country that I'm responsible for. Um, so they make arguments about how well the jobs are going to pay in their part of the country. Um, some of them make arguments about how many single men they have in their part of the country. So uh, this is one of my favorites. 
This is something that you could have read in a Chicago newspaper and it would have told you that in Garfield County, there are 1,100 unmarried men and only 28 women. Go west, girls. Uh, there are literally hundreds of these if you go back into the newspapers of these times. So both the politicians, journalists, oh, sorry. Apologies to the picture takers. Um, other active voices at this time are really putting a lot of effort into trying to say, hey, my territory is the best, and all y'all single ladies who are trying to figure out uh, what you want to do when you leave your father's house, you should consider moving here and you should consider taking a job in my part of the country. Okay, so we have two ingredients so far. We have these new career opportunities for women which are really more than career opportunities. They're life opportunities in the sense that they're a way to live in a completely different way than had been Im imaginable kind of prior to the birth of industry. We have this ability as a single woman to move across the country. And single women did move on their own. It wasn't it, So in the earliest days of settlement in the West, it is primarily families. Um, but later on, you do get women moving out on their own. They move out to be... Um, teachers, they move out to be uh, waitresses and stewards on the, the train stops that are built by the train companies. Um, they move out for a really wide variety of different opportunities, maybe some of them to, you know, get those attractive Garfield County men. Um, and so we have kind of the ingredients, we have the basic ingredients for a political situation in which it's going to make sense for um, those who are in charge of making the law to want to extend economic rights to women. Because um, you're never going to get them to move to those parts of the country and to take those kind of jobs if they're not going to be able to hold on to that property that they earn. Um, but we have another really important factor that we need to account for, um, kind of stepping back a bit which is that, you know, that kind of jump that I just made. So saying the fact that women are going to have this opportunity to now choose how they want to lead their life and that this is going to make thing, you know, you know, set up the political situation for an extension of rights. Um, that's only true if economic rights for women is something that is recognized by both the women and by the people who are making these legal changes as something that would be desirable. Um, so they have to believe that it's something these women would have wanted in order for them to try to use it as an incentive. All right, this is from the same uh, autobiography that I showed the quote from before. Women have an indefeasible and inalienable right to buy and sell solicit and refuse, choose and reject, as have men. These propositions we are prepared to defend, and while we have mind, talent, acquisition, ability, and a pen, we will defend them. Um, so this is straight out of the mouth of not just the kind of person, but a person that these industrial and political leaders were trying to attract into a particular opportunity, into a system. Uh, in this same uh, autobiography, she tells the account of her neighbor, the woman who worked the loom next to her, who would jump every time the door to the factory opened because she was so terrified that her husband had finally found her. So she'd been abandoned by her husband several years before. Under the law, even though he's been gone, it hasn't been seven years yet, so everything she owns is still his. So the second he finds her, the second he walks in the door, he can take everything that she has acquired in the amount of time since she's been working in the mill. So from reading the accounts that these women wrote, you know, if we even need to appeal to evidence on the fact that women might have liked to own property. I don't know if we need to appeal to evidence to demonstrate that that's true. Um, but we certainly know that this is something that bothered women, that was a concern 
to people who were exercising their voices and was a, a serious concern of the early women's rights advocates. Okay, so women believed that these women's economic rights mattered. Politicians believed that women's economic rights mattered. So I already showed you that politicians were working hard to attract women to the area. One ingredient of a lot of those appeals was this recognition that there are many things that can be done and must be done to secure immigration to this territory. We should be preeminently liberal in politics, in religion, and in social matters. So that's the governor of the territory of Idaho. So there's a recognition that those kind of rights matter. I already talked about that a little bit. So the main kind of new group that I want to introduce to this equation is that the other population that believed these things matter that is so important are the women who were you know, actively using their voices as women's rights advocates to try to bring about changes also recognize that these economic rights matter. So here, does anybody know who this, uh, this lady on the left? Yeah, that's Susan B. Anthony. Um, and these are her parents. Her father, Daniel Anthony, owned a textile factory that employed female workers in the 19th century. So Susan B. Anthony grew up around this process of industrialization, and she saw what kind of impact that it had on these young women. Uh, Susan B. Anthony initially wanted to become a lawyer. She was told she couldn't. Um, I can't remember the exact year that a state decided they would allow a woman entry to the bar, but it wasn't until much later in the 19th century. Um, and she found this so frustrating because she said, I've grown up around these young women who are productive, who are handling jobs, who are managing themselves. I just don't understand why, if I can produce on that level, I don't also have the same rights to make decisions over my life and what I'm going to do with my life. Um, so the fact that, and, and you know, Susan B. Anthony, of course, was a really really major voice in the early, the first wave women's rights movement. And so she and her collaborators really took this kind of idea that property rights were an important component of women's advancement seriously. Okay. The kind of fly I want to put into the ointment now. Um, so basically so far I've told you about a lot of the good things that happened in the 19th century that made economic advancement and extensions of women's rights more possible and made them easier. Um, it's never true that history is actually going to progress that neatly and cleanly. Um, so although a lot of the factors I described, so the incentives within the political system, the incentives within the economic system, they did work in a positive way, and they did bring about changes for women in the United States. Um, this was far from universal. And particularly, once we get up into the 1880s, 1890s, so by this time, most but not all states have protected married women's ability to own property and to keep earnings. But they're not really doing so in a principled way, by which I mean that other kind of pressure groups and influences that come around, uh, they don't always defend women's economic choice against these kind of new sets of ideas. And the particular ideological shift that I want to talk about um, at this particular moment is what's often referred to as the progressive movement. Um, and this is an ideological movement that takes place in the 19th century um, and early 20th century. Kind of, these are not necessary, these are intellectual influences. So progressives are not all Marxists, I'm not saying that, but Marx and Engels were some of their early intellectual influences. There were many more. Um, really, there was a large academy of intellectuals in Europe 
um, that was working on this set of ideas. And the core of the set of ideas that they were working on was this idea of using science to improve the social world. Um, and this manifested in a variety of different ways. This is when the, uh, the theory known as racism was kind of pioneered. So this idea that you could measure different groups of people and what they were capable of and then use that as a tool of kind of social policy was part of this intellectual movement. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of bring that back into the conversation again in a little bit. But for now, um, what I want to say first is about the influence, kind of how this shaped women's rights. As women begin to have the opportunity to get higher level educations, um, what some of them do with them is they go over to these European universities, they study in universities in Germany and in Switzerland, and there they pick up some of these ideas about um, the vision for the scientific improvement of society, and they bring them back to the United States, and they start what are called social reform organizations. This woman right here, um, this is a quote from Mary Van Cleek, who was a student of Florence Kelly, who started um, the organization that would become the National Trade Union League. She was really actively involved in a lot of different social reform organizations. Um, but Mary just articulates their philosophy so well. Um, so Mary is basically one of her students. And Mary says that their concern is that government essentially is dominated by the strongest economic power and becomes the instrument to serve the purposes of the group possessing that power. So industrial interests, in other words, have captured government, they're controlling government, and in addition to the industrial power that those forces have, they also have political power. So the reason why this is so um, devastating of an idea is the second half of the quote. To put this in terms familiar in American discussions, government tends to protect property rights rather than human rights. So we see here some rhetoric that is against the idea of property rights at all, not necessarily specific to women having property rights. The basic conflict of interest between labor and capital is then too clear to need further proof here. Um, so what does that mean? What this means is that she is pinpointing as the primary negative force in society this exploitation that the employer has over his workers. So this includes the power that the factory owners have over these women working in their factories. Um, although they do not limit their, their uh, concern exclusively to female workers, they think this is something that's a matter of concern to everybody who is employed in the capitalist economy. But at this period in time, the 1890s, um, attempts to regulate labor relations, so attempts to try to set explicit political limits on the kind of arrangements employers can make with their workers have mostly been unsuccessful in the courts. So these social reform organizations, including the ones um, that Florence Kelly supports, um, Jane Addams, Fanny Wright, you could think of as maybe being involved in an early one of these, um, just in case these are figures that you know. They're desperately looking for a way to try to correct what they see as a really egregious feature of American society, this exploitation within the capitalist system. They know it's not working writ large. They know they can't just go to Congress or to a state government and get the kinds of protections for the workers that they want. Um, but they come up with this really clever strategy, which they call the entering wedge. And you can hear, you can see a description of it in this court case, which was actually um, you know, kind of litigated within this state multiple times and only eventually came to finally be enacted. Uh, the injury to a girl or woman in her sexual function meaning here the bearing and raising of children, 
the breaking down not only of her own health and the shortening of her own life and productive power, but the injury to society, um, are dangers which the state, in the exercise of its police power, should carefully guard against. So even the usage of that terminology, the appeal to police powers, you can see as a way to find um, a point of entry that would make this kind of economic interference constitutional because it previously had not been considered to be so. And the basic idea is that they now have this argument for why the capitalist system, this power that an employer can have over the worker, is not just exploitative in itself and bad for the worker, but is actually a significant public harm. And this is why I introduced the idea of kind of racist theory earlier, because the great concern that they have in mind is that the white population is going to be overtaken by immigrants and minorities and other people that they considered at the time to be scientifically inf inferior. Um, it's, a, it's a very kind of ugly piece of history. Um, and it's kind of interesting how much of an influence this still has in our current legal codes. But so the public harm then is if women are working, they might not spend as much time taking care of their children and maybe they won't have as many children at all. Yes, question. Oh, there would have been no benefits on that kind of scale at all. So the question was about would there have been maternity leave available to these women? Um, most of these women, uh, so only kind of the very poorest women would have continued to marry after they start, or continued to work after they started having families. Um, for the most part, women worked kind of until they got married. Um, but having a baby that you wanted to stay at home with would have meant uh, taking time off from work. So for the most part, they would either uh, quit their job or they would leave the child in the care of a family member, um, was probably more common. But so this kind of quest to make sure that white women were having as many babies as they possibly could um, led to a great number of different kinds of lobbying efforts. So one of them was regulation that would limit the number of hours that women worked. So this is a map that was put together by one of these, um, it's actually by a government bureau that comes to be um, staffed by one of these social reformers, actually created by one of these social reformers. But because the regulation of labor isn't really a thing until this point. The people who had the idea to make it a thing um, get very involved in the creation of this, these early um, regulatory agencies and bureaucracies. So this is a map of the maximum number of hours it is okay for a woman to work in 1918. And this is a map. So the states that are colored in are the bad states that still allow women to work at night. Now, if you are a poorer single woman, why might you want to be able to work at night? Yeah, your kids are asleep and maybe your husband is home. So you don't have to worry about finding alternative care for them. So kind of this, the design of this regula regulation very specifically makes that kind of situation difficult. Um, the reason why I think this history is so important is that it shows this kind of shift in what the big trend in thinking about women's economic rights was over this period of time. So throughout most of the 19th century, you have women taking advantage of increasing economic opportunities. You have greater protections of their property rights. It's easier for them to make decisions about where they want to live and what they want to do with their lives. And then all of a sudden, that becomes a threat to what's perceived as what's best for the interests of the United States. And then you start to get the emergence of these countervailing kinds of regulations that say, oh, OK, you can make the decision to work, but not if you're going to stay too late. 
and not if you're going to work more than eight hours and not if you're going to um, you know, work this particular type of position on the railroad line rather than this type of position and not if your job requires lifting more than 25 pounds. So there's this whole different kind of laundry list of regulations that these social reform agencies lobby for and that they get enacted. Um, many of them are explicitly anti-competitive because part of the theory is not only that it will be bad if women have fewer babies, um, but it will be bad if we accidentally take a job away from a male breadwinner. So a woman might work in a job that maybe the head of household of a different family could have had. Um, so it's also, there's a little bit of that anti-competitiveness there in terms of women being perceived as encroaching on what should be men's jobs. Okay. So how can we think about the impact of this political legacy on women's lives today? Uh, so this, the, the PowerPoint is basically done. This is something that I want to talk about um, a little bit less formally and maybe throw out a few things that we can potentially discuss during the Q&A. I think this is a really hard question for people to grapple with. Um, not only because it's difficult to think about yourself as being potentially in a population that has, has these kinds of disadvantages, um, but it's also difficult to kind of stand in the modern world where we all do have these amazing opportunities. Um, you know, chances are if you're a young woman who wanted to go to college today, nobody told you you shouldn't go to college. That would be silly because you're not going to have a career. Um, in 2009, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics was awarded the prize for her research on economic institutions. Her name's Eleanor Ostrom. Um, she got divorced because her first husband did not want her to go to graduate school. Her parents thought it was ridiculous that she would leave her stable job as a secretary. Um, and she, so this is not that far back in history. We're talking about the 19 early 1950s. Um, so we're not talking about things that are kind of ancient history. We're talking about not only laws, but patterns of habit that developed out of those laws that really shaped the way women made decisions in this country for a very long period of time. Um, the Supreme Court didn't come out and say, you can't pass gender-specific labor regulation until I think it was actually in the 1970s. It was 1971 or 72, I can't remember the year of the case. It was not that far ago in history. It was up until about that time that it wasn't uncommon for companies to have policies that said women had to quit working if they got married. So these kinds of laws and common practices that really uh, kind of dampened what women would be able to get out of taking advantage of economic opportunities are, you know, they shaped the, the decisions that our mothers and grandmothers made. So when you're talking to, you know, almost every female academic I talk to has an experience like this of, you know, I won't get too specific about who it was, but, you know, going back home or, or interacting with somebody who uh, says something um, that implies that you're not really doing it to be serious, you're just biding your time until you can do the real thing that women do, which is have and raise babies. So for me, it was someone said to me, oh, I, you know, I told someone I was getting my PhD and their response was, oh, don't worry, honey, he'll propose soon, I'm sure. So, and this is not uncommon, you know, this is, this is not just me, this is a common experience. So I think that it's, we, we, it's silly for us to think that this is not going to still be shaping the decisions that people make today. Um, attitudes matter. Um, a lot of people who are doing still hiring at organizations across the country, um, you know, it was not even their mothers and grandmothers making these kinds of decisions. It, it would have been their, their wives who are under this kind of regime. And so it's, you know, it's very recent and that's something that we should take account of. Um, the other reason why I think it's really important 
and that this impact still matters today, is that since we are still coming out of that process, we still do have you know, a lot of the women participating in the economy, the decisions they've made about education and career choices have been shaped by these historical practices. So if you do something, um, like look at the gender wage gap. Okay, so the unadjusted gender wage gap is something like 71 cents on the dollar, which means if you don't adjust for women's career and occupational choices, they get paid on average 71 cents for every dollar a man makes. If you do adjust, meaning you compare like work to like work and like experience to like experience, it's something more like 93 cents to 97 cents on the dollar. So that, that's not nothing. If you thought about having to give up an extra 7% of your paycheck, you wouldn't be happy. Um, so nothing drives me crazier than when people try to say the gender wage gap doesn't exist because then they go about trying to explain it and why are they trying to explain something that doesn't exist. So I, so I find that a very strange kind of approach. Clearly it exists. Um, but then if you take that fact and use that to say, come up with this, uh, come to the conclusion that um, this is obviously being driven by contemporary bias, this is obviously being driven, one of the arguments you see sometimes is that it's driven by just women's innate preferences. Women's are, women are just naturally more social. They want to do the social jobs. They don't pay as much. They don't want to work as hard. They don't have the academic aptitude to do the highest skilled positions. Well, if you make those inferences based on choices, you know, data that's coming out of choices that women have made already, you know, over the past 10, 20, 50 years, then those are all choices that were made in the context of this history. So then to infer that there's something innate about that, that, that those numbers are not going to look entirely different tomorrow and that women are not going to be choosing and excelling in those kind of positions, I think is just making a conclusion far, far too soon about what the economy can actually look like and what women's opportunities can actually look like. Um, so I think that's one way that a lot of this stuff still matters is because we're using it as information um, that's going into policy decisions and policy determinations today. All right. What I'd really like to do now is start to hear from some of you and what some of your questions are. And maybe we can start addressing, because I know I kind of only really scratched the surface of explaining what women's rights were like in history. And there are a lot more debates we can get into about the legacy of this in the American economy still today. Um, so please kind of let me know what you guys want to hear about. I want to answer your questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll take some microphones to you. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, I have three observations and I invite your comments on each. The Initial presentation struck me, I couldn't avoid this, thinking it was rather economic determinism. And a Marxist would be quite happy with a lot of what you said. <laughs> um, and, and that brings me on to my second point, which is actually behind the Married Property, Women's Property Act, and a whole lot of law that changed the, the status of women, was, uh, as you know well, um, a philosophical um, uh, changes. And it wasn't just driven by economic forces. So I say as a Marxist, I guess you are going to say it's going to be driven by economic forces. But in fact, there are a whole lot of people, <laughs> you know, John Stuart Mill going way back to the 18th century and before that, who are going to talk about women's rights, right? <laughs> okay, so um, that was the second observation. Um, the third observation, actually I've got four observations, I guess. The third observation, and I'm interested to hear what you have to say this. Uh, the third observation is, as you're probably aware, there is the industrious revolution that precedes the industrial revolution, and, and that was true in the United States. It, well, what was the colonies, right? Just as much as it was true in the Netherlands and in Britain. And that saw women going out to work and working much more than they did previously, and that was an extension of the market, and that was long before there were changes in the law for women. And then, actually, the irony is that you bring in the Married Women's Property Act in Britain in 1882, and then around that time in America, and as you said, it's extended by state by state. 
Um, and that is that, and you gave examples of women, young women, right, who before they get married, who are who are interested in moving to better jobs, and that's fine. But what actually happened with the Industrial Revolution from about 1850 onwards was that men's wages rose enough that they didn't need to have women working. And so women spent more time in the home, and that takes up for about a century through to about 1950 when the women's participation in the workforce has declined and then turns around and, of course, approaches male participation rates today. And finally, I would just say... Um, I, I mean, I hear this from all my libertarian friends all the time about eugenics and do they throw in, you know, scientific racism and things. But uh, <laughs> I always feel that, I mean, there, there's a lot, I mean, I realise that a lot of it was, you know, scientific racism and so on. But um, I do think it's, an, I think it's a little bit cheap, uh, not necessarily, I mean, not just you, but other people to throw that in without really saying a little bit more all about it because there was a genuine I mean there was a genuine concern now admittedly it was more in terms of white race than than obviously <laughs> other races I, but there was a genuine concern about the fate of women and their fertility and so on in heavy factory labor and uh, uh, I mean in many ways the idea of having you know to, to, uh, to allow to allow women to be able to have children and not be burdened down and so on is, is not it's not entirely a bad thing, right? In one way, from you know, I mean, I realise I'm, I'm in favour, you know, I have a daughter and I'm all in favour of women being independent and so on. But I mean, uh, it's not surprising that both men and women, right, did see that some of the factory conditions at the time uh, could be uh, intruding on their fertility and the time they spent with their children. And so on. So I mean, it, it's it. Yes, it is. It is cast in terms of a white race and all that sort of stuff. But 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 it, it's not entirely that. And then there was that. Dare I say, a gratuitous reference to Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And um, <laughs> I mean, they really didn't have much impact on the American progressive movement. Uh, I, I suggest. Um, and. Uh, uh, so it, it, at least if there is the connection there, it needs to be drawn out. So those are my thoughts. But thank you for coming and oh, thank you for your talk. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Just very briefly on the last remark, the reason why I brought up Marx and Engels is that uh, the uh, Florence Kelly, her uh, she actually was a student of Engels kind of indirectly and in that her husband was one of his students and then she was primarily a student of his husband's. So with particular reference to that kind of social reform group, um, he actually was kind of a direct influence, but I but I take your point that it's a lot of um, that it's much more complicated than that. Um, and th this is always one of the difficulties with trying to explain historical phenomena is there's always so much more actually going on than you can capture um, in any particular explanation. Um, so with reference to the point about is this an argument that the situation we see on the ground that people's fates are entirely determined by their economic status. Um, I, you know, I hope it's not. Um, one of the things that I, I am trying to do with this project is to bring together the different economic and political and ideological influences. And what I want to, so I am an economist by training, so what I want to try to do is look at effects on the margins. Um, so not that this is entirely deterministic, but that these are all factors that um, have an influence in one direction or another. Um, but yeah, there's always so much more that can be accounted for than is actually possible in these situations. So thank you for those um, uh, bringing up some of those complexities. Hello. Thank hey. you so much for this talk. This was, uh, this, was uh, this provided a lot of insight um, into topics that, uh, that we haven't really been able to, um, to get into as much. Uh, so this is perfect. Uh, I do have to ask some of those earlier comments about some of the movements towards industrialization for women and uh, the kind of economic opportunities. I'm, I'm just wondering now how much of that was, was really uh, the men in the situation that benefited from having these factory workers that came down from whatever area. Now you wouldn't really, you wouldn't on your own payroll go out and send people to uh, to various towns for for uh, for no economic benefit, so I'm wondering what kind of incentives the the factory work the factory owners seem to have gained more of a benefit than the women, or else uh, there would have been opportunities for you know further education, uh, further development into uh, you know further along into the career, maybe you know pick up some of the engineering elements, those kind of things that. 
that would have put them in a better economic position than, than just working on the factory floor up until you're about 25. So I'm just, your comments on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, economics doesn't really have the tools to compare who benefited more than whom. Um, kind of all we can know from observing that relationship, from observing the fact that women went to work in those factories, is that it was better for the women, and it was better for the employer, you know, better for the, meaning better for them than whatever current situation they're in, that they saw it as an improvement in their lives at that moment. Um, and we also can know that it benefited the factory workers. Like you're saying, clearly, there is a reason why they were investing so much into trying to recruit. Um, in terms of how we can compare those two, I don't know if we possibly ever can. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind in this period of time is that, you know, in 1800, it was over 90% of the population of the United States was farming. Um, the United States was extremely poor. There just wasn't a lot of opportunity for highly skilled work. You know, relative to the time, these would have been considered highly skilled jobs. Um, so it's always kind of, I think it's nice to be able to try to step back and put it in that context and try to ask, you know, for the choice set that this woman had, what kind of opportunity would it have looked like to her? And of course, that's a difficult thing to do. But thank you for your question. Here we go. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is Julie Kavana Jerbic, and I'm going to hopefully ask you a slightly easier question than you've received so far. So I believe history is a great teacher uh, for us to really think about the future and maybe even the present. And it is very much known that you know we are seeing, especially in the Silicon Valley, that we have a phenomenon where the only woman in the room is once again increasing at the higher levels in organizations. Um, more women are dropping out of the workforce. They're you know, selecting to raise the children. They're selecting to spend less time at work or to spend less time in higher level roles or really achieving to get that you know, next position and higher level position. Can you comment on that and what you see from history and how the pendulum swings? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, because there are still a lot of industries in which, um, like you said, it's easy to be the only woman. I've been the only woman in the room many times as an economist. Um, you know, Universities are often kind of slow to reform, and econo economics in particular is one of the disciplines that's been even slower to change than some others. OK, so you have a problem like, or you have a situation, like extremely unequal, gender participation in a particular role. You know, how do, how do you go about analyzing that? I, I guess one piece of information that I think is very relevant is that since there, there is significant differences between different industries into how that situation looks. So there are some types of occupations where women have advanced significantly more than they have in others. Um, Claudia Golden has some very interesting research where she looks at uh, the way women advance through different professions. And one of the arguments she makes and one of the things she finds is that if you have an industry where kind of the terms of employment are more flexible, so something like a pharmacist, um, there is um, near gender parity in, in pharmacy. Um, and one of the arguments she makes is that it's because you don't have to work from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. every day. You can have an afternoon and evening shift. Um, you can work on the weekends instead of during the week. It's a job that offers greater flexibility. And so she has a really interesting paper where she goes through and looks at all different kinds of evidence that suggest that the more flexible companies can be in their policies, the more compatible they can make those policies with raising children, um, which makes it easier for women to succeed over the long term. Because... Just an unfortunate reality is that the years in which you can have children also tend to be years in which people make some of their most significant advancements in their careers. Um, particularly in academia, that's true um, because that's the stage at which you're getting your first jobs and being evaluated for tenure and things like that. Um, so more flexible policies can make a difference. And then the other thing I'll say to that 
is that most of the research that shows that if you try to fix that uh, kind of problem through some kind of quota system, so Norway, for example, experimented with mandating that they have a certain percentage of women on their boards of directors. I believe it was 30%. Uh, this was preliminary research. I'm not sure, it, you know, it might have been kind of debunked at some point, but at least their initial finding was that those companies actually took uh, a hit on their value because what they had to do in order to fill those positions was bring in inexperienced people um, because it was just simply too hard for them to find women who had the same kind of level of experience. So these are things that it's, it's really hard to change on the margins. I think thinking more creatively about what success means, about bringing flexibility into the environment, um, things like that can probably have much more potential for a longer term impact than trying to um, just kind of, you know, force a change this instant that might wind up actually disadvantaging particular individuals. actually add to shareholder value. Yeah. So that is basically, it's not Norway specific. I do, yeah. I do believe you're correct, but in general that UC Davis board has tracked the diversity of boards and has proven that that, uh, in terms of both gender and, and race, that it was more profitable for shareholders and investors. But your point's taken, thank you. We have one more question over here. Um, hi. So hi. I wanted to thank you for putting on such an amazing uh, just talk here. It was incredibly informative oh, and just really pleasant to be able to sit and enjoy. Um, I do have a question regarding kind of the power of marriage um, today. Um, since it's a power that's held by men through their abil our ability to propose at this point, so I'm kind of curious on what was the social stigma around women during this injustice or women in factories during this industrial time period? And did a lot of women end up leaving factories in order to become more quote suitable for marriage? And does that, does this power of marriage still um, play into people's economic decisions or to women's economic decisions today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in these early factories, most of these women did quit their jobs before they got married. Um, so kind of a, a working married woman is something that did not become common until later in history still. Um, you know, the, the kind of, I think marriage and most studies of marriage from different disciplines and from different perspectives, I think, generally view it as a, um, an institution that's much more symmetrical today than it was um, kind of at any time in history. Um, so there was a lot of really interesting research. It, you know, it was the case that in most states until the 1970s, this kind of started to change, um, that you had to prove that your husband or that your spouse had harmed you in some way to get a marriage. So it was that, that, that's a fault-based divorce system. So we switched over to a no-fault divorce system. And now you can get a divorce for any reason that you want. Um, and one of the interesting research findings that came out of that is once you switch to a no-fault system, there is a lot less murder of spouses. There's a lot less <laughs> domestic abuse. <laughs> and a lot less suicide, um, so a, a lot. I don't, I don't mean like huge percentages of the population, but there are, that, that's, a, that's a significant effect on all of those practices. And so I think the fact that it's an institution that is entered into more voluntarily, um, we're on the upswing in terms of people waiting until later in life to get married, which enables making better kind of marriage decisions um, so I'm not sure it's a, an institution that has those same kind of properties in terms of there being a differential power dynamic um, as there used to be. Um, so you mentioned something about flexible policies. Um, I'm just curious, what's your input regarding what might flexible policies look like when it comes to um, high-level positions for women, and do you think that it holds any relevance into the future? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So thinking about um, introducing flexibility in policies is a difficult thing to do because it's going to require people to reconceptualize how they evaluate the people that they work with. So for example, one of the points that uh, Claudia Golden makes in that paper is that especially at the higher levels of, so at the very highest levels of performance, if you're the CEO of a company, a lot of your job performance is going to be, you know, is the stock price going up? Is it going down? Is the company moving in a profitable direction? So those are things that are easy to evaluate. But kind of at that like mid upper level management level, say you're head of HR, it's really difficult to tell how well you are doing your job. So you could do something catastrophically bad or you could do something amazing, but kind of in the middle, it's difficult to tell. So what this means is that people often resort to using things that are more easily observable to be able to evaluate performance, like how many hours do you spend in the office? So there's often kind of a disadvantage to people who might want to work from home so they could be with their kids or to, to telework, things like that. Um, so it's going to require a little bit of adjustment in terms of the way we think about those kind of relationships and advancement and evaluating performance. Is it going to happen? To what extent is it possible? I think it'll happen some places and not others. Um, I think it's more likely to happen in more dynamic industries. Uh, th there's kind of a, this is a very meta level question, but how much can an organization actually internally change? Or does it just succeed or fail, and then a better organization maybe comes to exist? Um, so I have confidence that things will be better in the future, simply because companies have and entrepreneurs in general have demonstrated that they are remarkably effective at when there's a way to take advantage of a source of value, that they'll eventually find a way to do that. And if you're underutilizing women in your economy, that's an amazing source of value. Um, so I think that these things will improve over the long run. Will they improve in the short run or in every industry? That's something that, so it's unlikely to be every industry, but it's impossible to know, you know how much we'll be able to improve. Hi, well, once again, thank you for the presentation. Um, personally, to me, it sort of reaffirmed the power of economic incentives, which I think, mm -hmm. I mean, even historically, it is proven. So my question is uh, related to that. It seems that the start of women's economic uh, rights came about through econ the power of economic incentives, which uh, started with when industrial technology made its way to the United States and then how, um, how the government saw a, a sort of uh, potential in having more women workers and giving them more rights. So basically my question is, is, is the inception of the idea of women's rights in the US, is it born out of an economic need or did it have a sort of uh, ideological precedent to it? Or was it came out of purely economics? Yeah, that's a great question. And that relates to a point that I was actually thinking about in response to the, the first question you'd asked, sir, uh, which is um, this idea of you know why did this change not really happen until the 19th century, even though we had increasing economic productivity on women's part earlier than that. And the reason I bring that up is that there's a really complex relationship between economic rights and the political system. So if, for example, a lot of historians think that in terms of actual practice on the ground, that women had a lot more ability to freely make economic choices in the late 1700s than they did in the early 1800s. Um, so kind of in the, in the years immediately following the founding of the United States, uh, there are not nearly as formal legal systems and access to courts and things like that than there are later on. It kind of takes some time for the, the legal enforcement apparatus to get up to speed, for all of the laws to be written, things like that. And so one of the hypotheses that's advanced is that this process of political formalization um, actually took away some rights that maybe had actually been kind of informally practiced before that time. I think there's some plausibility to that account because we see it in the developing world still today. For example, with um, land ownership systems, there's a, a big movement in parts of, in kind of the international development world to codify 
light rights over land for people who currently just have informal ownership systems. And so one thing that's happened in a few of those cases is that in areas where women had previously actually had a pretty significant degree of control over land because it was just a family decision process, once somebody comes in and says, okay, now we're going to formally title this land, all of a sudden you get this kind of fight between all the people in the family over who, who, whose name the title is going to have on it. And sometimes that has wound up actually transferring what was kind of practical ownership away from women and into um, you know, others that might have had more kind of power or status in the family, usually a, a male member of the family. So I have a question about the people who are trying to get physicians for their daughters, shipping them overseas. How do I get them into this new uh, fangled career? Was it because of the lack of ability to take care of a female? Uh, or was it that there was expectation of uh, getting money back to the family? Did the females have the same thing that generally goes with the male, that you have to give money back and contribute to your parents' household? Or were they just kind of better to get rid of you and you can be self-sufficient because we can't take care of you? A lot of these women were sending money back home. Um, and I think that probably is particularly true in, in the case of people who are kind of so desperate for these jobs, they're even willing to send them across country. I think it is a very similar kind of effect to, say, an immigrant moving to a different country for a better job today and then sending a lot of that money home. And they, we, we know they were sending it back home to their families. Um, in some cases, I mean, one of the just little, I already said it, but I just think it's really cool, the fact that women were putting their brothers through school um, and just advancing their family and making such a significant contribution in that way. Um, I think that's a very important part of this puzzle. So if you ask the World Bank, they'll say we have not because we don't have a constitutional amendment that explicitly declares gender equality. Um, but to the best of my knowledge and that I've been able to identify, there are no gender-specific restrictions remaining in the American legal code. Oh, but yeah, that's a good one. So maybe I should say that disadvantaged women. Other questions? Forget, I always have questions. <laughs> uh, two questions. One is difficult to phrase. It has to do with the importance you put on technology for many of these economic, political, ideological, ideological changes. I guess if you were to go further down the road, I would add the invention of contraceptives as being a crucial technological change for women's rights. Um, how do you see, and a lot of the things have changed, the norms have changed. It, it's maybe, you know, you can argue which one was first, which one, but let's just forget about that for now. Many of the things have changed for us, but the biological fact still remains women are the ones bearing children and, you know, feeding those children for the first six months. Um, so if decisions are made on the margin, this will have implications for you know, their participation in the labor market, their wages, et cetera, et cetera, their choices. Mm -hmm. Is there any technological change that you may see? I know it's very hard to look at technological changes in the future, right? They never, you know, can never predict them. But is there anything that you can see in the future which would allow women to get through that final barrier of equality? At least as I see it. That's my first question. Or is it purely institutional? Uh, my second question is, how do you see, because the United States is really quite unique right now, being the only, con the only developed country in the world not having any mandated paid paternal or maternal leave. What impact does this have for American women if you compare it to really legally enforced uh, paid maternal paternal leave in most, most all developed countries? My view is that it's actually much better for women that we do not have paid maternal leave. And the reason for that is that, like you said, 
Um, many women are on the margin about the decision whether or not to work at all. And one thing they don't need is laws that make it more expensive to hire them relative to men. Um, so if you're having to go up and compete against men in these jobs, your employer already knows that you might be out for some period of time if they know that you also, they also have to pay you while you're gone, I think that's potentially a dangerous disincentive. Um, that being said, I think a company would be very wise to set up policies in a way that make it easy for women to succeed in those careers, including possibly offering um, optional maternity leave. Um, and that could be a benefit that could attract women to working in a particular company or industry that others may not provide. So one thing that I would not want to have happen is, for example, um, a small business who, literally, who only has one employee can't afford to keep you know, that one employee paid when they can't do work. It could put them out of business entirely. So my preference would be to find a way to make maternity work without going to that, what I would say, kind of an extreme step of mandating that that woman is going to have to be compensated um, regardless of whether or not she's producing at that particular moment in time. So I guess I would just call attention to the potential that there are disincentive effects there. The first question? The first... Just About right. the, any potential technological changes? Oh, um, so with the flexibility of the policies, I think the greater ability to take advantage of technology and work in ways that are, you know, my job is very not, very much not tethered to a particular hours of the day, for example. And a lot of the reason for that is technology, communication over email, things like that. I think that's one potential technological advantage. Um, and you're right, like, that I don't have, you know, ability to kind of guess further in the future what might make better. Um, one thing I will say is that these technologies are often, um, they're important. One of the reasons they're important is as disruptors. They kind of create the opportunity for new sets of ways, of rules, of ways of doing things to kind of come about that there wasn't an opportunity to even devise before. Those moments are hard to predict ahead of time, but those can be some of the greatest moments for change um, in terms of how we think about um, just the way we manage our lives and manage ourselves. And one thing I will say is going forward, you know, kind of at a certain point, Another reason why the question about women's rights gets hard to have is that there's also this reality that we all just face individual disadvantages on many different kinds of margins. Maybe it's our personality. There's a lot of research that people who are attractive get paid more, things like that. Um, there are a lot of, so there are a lot of kind of benefits and advantages, costs, disadvantages that we all face. Um, to what extent you know, gender is going to be a really important one of those margins going forward, I think kind of remains to be seen. It might not be, especially if we look at how well, for example, young women are performing in academics. Um, it, it's not obvious to me that that's going to continue to be kind of one of the most, or one of the more detrimental problems that we're going to have to deal with in the United States. So in other parts of the world, certainly, but maybe not in the United States for too much longer. Okay, we have one more question. Go ahead. Uh, in regards to uh, women in developing countries, currently you still face similar economic situations as you mentioned in the 18th and 19th century, who, though legally they may have the right to pursue work with uh, higher levels of human capital because of society or because of their family constraints, they're still, you know, because of gender roles, they're still expected to bear the burden of the family and, you know, expect to take care of their children. How do you think internationally in the use of technology because of the internet and like the organizations that are appealing towards uh, women in those countries and you know basically giving the opportunities to come to America and you know coming to grad school, uh, do you think that will improve or do you think uh, we have to kind of wait as we did with America for the society, the country's legislation to catch up with the times, or do you think uh, the, the international access has kind of uh, accelerated that process in those countries? Yeah, I think there's no question that access to a larger global market creates more opportunities for women to be able to make different kinds of decisions. Um, so we see this with new financing technologies that have been kind of enabled by smartphones. So there are areas of the world that don't have access to traditional financial institutions, but can get them and get investments through 
kind of cellular technologies. The fact that a woman from a less developed economy might have the chance to come and work in a more developed economy and develop skills she couldn't before. I mean, that's exactly one of these kinds of opportunities outside the norm that can be taken advantage of to kind of push the envelope. Um, I saw, I, where did I see it? I read a really interesting story. I, um, on the flight out here, I picked up a National Geographic magazine and there was a story about these three Iranian women in London who run a TV show um, that gets piped into the country where they wear, and they wear normal Western clothes and they talk about contemporary issues and the women there see this. Um, and so the fact that you get those kinds of cultural influences and things transmitted back, um, I think all of these are margins where you can get not only economic opportunity, but also ideological change and hopefully kind of limit the extent to which political bodies can continue to enforce these kind of rules that are discriminatory in this way. Could we have a round of applause for our speaker?